I'm a biology researcher, and so everything in my work makes sense, only in the light of evolution. Today I'd like to tell you about why I think we need a deeper understanding of how Darwinian evolution has shaped the mind and motivations of the human animal, and in particular, why it hasn't made us as smart as we often think we are. Here's why it matters. Civilization as we know it is in trouble. We've become too successful. There are too many of us now, and we're trashing the planet. We got this way because of what we are. And the critical question is, are we equipped to respond effectively to what we have done? There is no reason to suspect that we should be, and there is plenty of reason to suspect that we may not be. Here I argue that being equipped will depend on whether we can come to a deeper and more broadly public understanding of what we are. And this will require understanding that what we are is from the past. And so what are we? Humans are fascinated with themselves. Our obsession with this question is why the arts and humanities exist. They have given us more than science, a mirror of the inner self, showing how the motivations and social lives and cultures of humans are unlike any other creature. But they have not shown us why, and they have never aspired to do so. The arts and humanities thrive by leaving the what are we question essentially unanswered as an enduring and revered mystery. But evolutionary biology has given us a very clear and certain perspective of what we are. We are an animal among many millions of others, the vast majority of which have long been extinct, a species that is only about 200,000 years old, but descended from a very long lineage, most of which was not human. When Charles Darwin published his theory on the origin of species in 1859, one of his main public opponents was a clergyman named Bishop Wilberforce. His wife was famously reported to have said in a conversation to a friend, My dear, have you heard Mr. Darwin's theory that we are all descended from apes? Let us hope that this is not true. And if true, let us hope that it not become generally known. Well, the hope of Mrs. Wilberforce turned out to be a prophecy largely fulfilled. For example, in the province of Ontario, the amount of human evolution that is required to be covered in the high school curriculum is zero. And so, it seems to me as a biologist that in responding effectively to a collapsing civilization, our greatest limitation is that we don't really know ourselves very well at all. Like other animals, the behavior of humans is informed by the effects of genes inherited from the ancestral past. But our genes do not bark orders. They only whisper to us. These animals are creatures who spend their whole lives just trying to get fed, stay alive, and get laid. <laughs> that's about it. But that's all they need in order to leave descendants, in other words, for gene transmission success, which is what biologists call evolutionary fitness. And these extinct species of early humans were probably also creatures who spent their whole lives just trying to get fed, stay alive, and mate with each other. And this is certainly true of chimpanzees, our closest living ge genetic relative in the family of great apes. Survival and sex done well is pretty much all that these animals require in order to transmit gene copies successfully into future generations. And of course, our species must also accomplish these in order to leave descendants. But the motivations of modern humans involve so much more. As acclaimed philosopher Albert Camus said, 
We humans are creatures who spend our whole lives trying to convince ourselves that our existence is not absurd. Our species inherited genes from ancestors that gave us an awareness of time, awareness of self, and an awareness that others also have self-awareness. This gave us a whole new advanced toolkit for social intelligence on a scale unavailable to other animals, allowing us to predict the behavior of others and to gauge how we might be perceived by others. We became ever more skilled experts at cooperation, negotiation, and teamwork, and at the same time, masters of manipulation, deception, cheating, and lying. But this self-consciousness also gave us an ability to foresee our own death. A being who knows that he will die arose from ancestors who did not know. Now this might have been all well and fine, but natural selection was not finished. It also gave us an anxiety about this. But not so much an anxiety about the eventual experience of literal death. Rather, it gave us an anxiety about what eventual death imposes, impermanence of the self. Self-impermanence anxiety is about worrying that one's life is absurd, meaningless, pointless, without purpose. It's a fear of not being able to leave something of oneself for the future. Not just because time brings eventual death, but more specifically because in bringing eventual death, Time inevitably annihilates all that we do and all that we are. And so our evolution has given us some self-impermanence anxiety buffers to manage this curse of consciousness. There are two types, and they are represented very effectively in this well-known manifesto for life. Dream as if you will live forever. Live as if you will die today. The first of these is just a delusion about being able to leave a legacy, something of oneself that will transcend death. And the second is a distraction provided by leisure, free time indulgence in opportunities for pleasure. And so humans have more than just a survival drive and a sex drive. We are also motivated by what I call a legacy drive and a leisure drive. The critical question, though, is why would evolution give us an anxiety about self impermanence? Perhaps it was just an emotional cost that for our ancestors was worth paying because it was generally outweighed by the fitness benefits of the awareness of time and self consciousness. I suggest that. Our ancestors could manage this anxiety because they evolved dispositions to be easily distracted by leisure. And cultural evolution informed by biological evolution has given us a large leisure menu to choose from. All of these many modern domains of leisure drive are rooted in the same kinds of pleasure modules that rewarded the reproductive success of ancestors, including those associated with obtaining food, securing shelter, exploration, social status, success in competition, cooperation in social alliances, companionship, intimacy, family relations, recreational sex, humor, amusement, aesthetic entertainment, toys, stories, meditation, and intoxication. In addition, however, I suggest that our evolution gave us an anxiety about self-impermanence because it also rewarded the reproductive success of our ancestors by making them susceptible to a delusion of legacy. In particular, legacy through parenthood. As Dobzhansky wrote, man has a hope, perhaps an illusory one, that he somehow survives in his descendants. A life devoted to one's family and to one's progeny seems to acquire a meaning. It may be experienced as capturing a particle of an immortality 
which is beyond the reach of an individual. Legacy drive, in its rudimental form then, is about genes that fooled our ancestors into thinking that they could leave something of themselves, ideas, beliefs, values, a copy of the inner self, or memes of a parent, transmitted to the future through the minds of one's offspring as a mimetic legacy. And because genetic legacy also occurred at the same time, Genes that informed legacy drive were propelled into future generations. Other animals have offspring only as an incidental consequence of sex drive. But only humans hope and plan for offspring and then spend much of their lives seeking pride in them. And this obsession with pride in offspring can be seen in some of the oldest written records. But men have always had a nagging uncertainty of their paternity. As Pulitzer Prize winning author Phyllis McGinley wrote, women are the fulfilled sex. Through our children we are able to produce our own immortality so we lack that divine restlessness which sends men charging off in pursuit of fortune or fame or an imagined utopia. And so mostly men have created alternative domains for legacy, like pursuits of imagined utopias, typically represented by religion. As philosopher James Feebleman wrote, the human individual knows that he must die, but has thoughts larger than his fate. Religion is an effort to be included in some domain larger and more permanent than mere existence. In addition, men, mostly men, have created alternative domains for legacy that involve pursuit of fortune or fame. And cultural evolution, informed by biological evolution, has generated a large legacy menu to choose from that includes more than just parenthood and religion, but also accomplishment. Accomplishment through things like achievement in education, status in a reputable career, competition for awards, prestige from volunteering, mentorship and philanthropy, recognition for kindness, bravery and other virtues, membership or leadership in a social or cultural group, and popularity with family, friends and associates. Darwinian evolution then has shaped the human mind with motivations that convince us that our lives can have meaning and that distract us from the nagging worry that they probably don't, that time inevitably annihilates all that we do and all that we are. Legacy and leisure drives are components of our evolved psychology because our predecessors who lacked them did not become our ancestors because they were unprotected from self-impermanence anxiety and so less likely to reproduce. And the irony here is that Darwinism postulates exactly the opposite of what our evolved psychology whispers to us about what we can be and what we can do. One of the leading architects of the modern evolutionary synthesis in the last century, George Gaylord Simpson wrote, Man is the result of a purposeless and materialistic process that did not have him in mind. He was not planned. He is a state of matter, a form of life, akin to all of life, and indeed to all that is material. And so, the old and still continuing debate between evolution and creationism is misguided. Creationism is not in conflict with evolution. It is product of it. And so the central problem of what we are is that we are attracted instinctively to delusions and distractions. As poet T.S. Eliot mused, humankind cannot bear very much reality. This does not bode well in terms of our being equipped to respond effectively to a collapsing civilization. 
Our lives resemble the lives of chimps more than any other animal. They have a rudimental theory of mind and a capacity for culture through social learning across generations. But chimps live in a world as they find it. Humans, however, live in a world as they make it. And we have made it mostly a world of delusions for chasing legacy and mostly a world of distractions for chasing leisure. And this has made a world that is annihilating other species at a rate never seen before in the history of life and a civilization that is unsustainable for our species. Because we are a product in part of Darwinian evolution, our genes to a large extent hold culture on a leash. As evolutionist E.O. Wilson wrote, human behavior, like the deepest capacities for emotional response which drive and guide it, is the circuitous technique by which human genetic material has been and will be kept intact. These deeply ingrained motivations are a product of a long history of genetic inheritance, driven in each ancestral generation by the relentless but purposeless action of Darwinian selection. In the past, these motivational domains limited our capacity to learn from the history of our mistakes. They loomed large on the radar of our ancestors, leaving little room for a deep understanding of the impact of humanity on our small planet and essentially no room for significant motivations to protect it. But our evolution has also given us capacity to say no to our evolutionary bequeathals. And so the good news is that culture can also hold genes on a leash if we instruct it wisely with what it needs to do so. I suggest that we can do this by something that I call biosocial management. It's about recognizing and embracing what we are, defined by these four fundamental human drives, but prescribing ways to fulfill them that also make room on our radar for responding effectively to the impending collapse of civilization. In other words, cultural evolution could come to our rescue, but there is much work to be done Cultural evolution will need to be better informed with what it needs in order to promote the positive consequences and manage the negative consequences of our biological evolution. And this will require having a much deeper and more broadly public understanding of what we are. Thank you. <laughs>